Lester J. Hendershot, Hendershot Magnetic Motor. During the late 1920s Lester J. Hendershot, while working on a new type of aviation compass, stumbled across a method of generating energy. The Hendershot magnetic motor made headlines and attracted such big-name investors as Charles Lindbergh. Hendershot, while attempting to establish a true magnetic north compass, found that by cutting the same line of magnetic force north and south, he had an indicator of the true north and that by cutting the magnetic field east and west, he could develop a rotary motion. He wove together a number of flat coils of wire and placed stainless steel rings, sticks of carbon and permanent magnets in various positions as an experiment. Based on this principle, after two years of trial and error, he built a magnetic motor that would self-rotate, to his surprise, at a constant speed of 1800 rpm while producing 45 horsepower. Hendershot changed directions and decided to build a generator on the same principle, after deducing that a magnetically powered motor was not as practical as a magnetically powered generator. Hendershot had discovered that the Earth's rotating magnetic field could be used to provide power to motors and generators, much like Nikola Tesla's discovery that the Earth was a huge capacitor, capable of providing significant amounts of electrical power. Simplified, Hendershot believed that if one were to cut the lines of force of the Earth's magnetic field, one could harness this to provide direct power to generators and motors. Nikola Tesla attempted to do just that, when he built his magnifying transformer at Shoreham, Long Island, New York. To read the first-hand accounts of Hendershot's historical encounters, see the following research. Hendershot ran into political difficulties in promoting his device, attempted to take his business to Mexico, and finally faded into obscurity having taken a couldn't refuse payoff to never work on his device again. Source, http colon slash slash www.ssrzi.org slash sr2 slash heat slash fed.htm right parenthesis. In 1961 Dr. Ed Skilling, from Columbia University, successfully replicated and tested a Hendershot free energy device, out of which he got 300 watts. Skilling had been associated with Hendershot and learned of the device through him. The generator was self-resonant at 500 kHz. James Watson, 8 kW battery popper motor. Thomas E. Bearden, Ph.D., has provided a significant account, dated 1999, regarding James Watson located at http colon slash slash www.shenyuri.org slash miscellaneous slash battery percent sign 20 poppers .htm comma copied as follows with some editing, James Watson successfully replicated Bedini's battery energizer, with direct advice from Bedini. Watson made improvements and modifications, and eventually was able to build one and adjust it as he wished. He demonstrated an 8 kW battery popper motor at the first International Tesla Conference in Colorado Springs in 1984. Later Watson was moving toward development and marketing. Then Watson and his entire family disappeared. Neither Bedini nor I could locate him. Neither. Could his financial backer, the late R.J. Reynolds III. This was a researcher and friend whom I was in contact with several times a week. Then bingo. Nothing further. He Jim Watson abruptly and completely broke off all communication with everyone. A squirrel a message was left on his answering machine for a few days, saying he had moved, but not in Jim's voice. Then it too was removed. And that was that. Eerily, it seems that if you call the police in the town where Jim Watson lived, they will tell you he still lives there on the same street in the same house. At least that's what they told a friend of mine who checked a few months ago, which is years after Jim and his family originally disappeared. And that check may be the oddest thing of all. The police implied on the phone that Jim and his family never disappeared. Everything fine. A-OK. -okay. And that's a bald-faced lie. He and his family did disappear. No one could find them, regardless of how they tried. His financial backer couldn't even find him. The clear implication is, stay away from that one. Somebody from the dark side may have made Jim the offer he could not refuse. One may never know what really happened, 
whether or not Jim ever surfaces again or has already surfaced again and is living there very, very quietly. But Jim's entire over Unity motor effort ended abruptly, even though highly successful. And even though the motor was almost ready to be put into production. Watson has not been seen at an energy conference since that sudden mysterious disappearance. No one has had a phone call from him. I have not found anyone I trust who has seen him again. You have not seen a Watson over Unity power system go to market. You almost certainly never will. Yet Watson's device was perfected to the point where he could make the things like pretzels, adjust them readily, and they worked every time. They could have been put into mass production very easily. Obviously that made him a grave threat to the energy cartels around the world. At rare intervals, the energy cartel does suppress an invention and an inventor by making the inventor an offer he cannot refuse, in mafia terms. Presently the going price when that offer is made is $10 million. You take your $10 million, quit all research, quit your contacts, and you live. But you live very quietly, although you live very well financially. The engineers who measured Watson's 8 kilowatt machine there in Colorado Springs are still alive. And they know what they measured. There's one other little thing. At that same international Tesla conference in Colorado Springs, the folks who were in charge, for the energy barons, of suppressing all successful over Unity devices in the Western world were also there when Watson demonstrated his 8 kilowatt device. There is a certain effect which happens in a battery sometimes for a large over Unity battery popper unit like that, if the device is for real. Time reversal operations and wave transductions can occur, resulting in time excitation charging inside the battery materials, in a negative time charge sense, remember, the over Unity operation is a nesiontropic operation. After a machine of that type and with that particular internal effects has been used to furnish energy for quite a while, you can make a definitive test on it. Simply hook it to a normal battery charger for that size battery, and start to charge it. You then may find to your surprise that the power will just seem to disappear in that battery, without charging the needle one iota, for 16 to 48 hours or longer, and in a rare case for two weeks. The reason is that wave transduction occurs of your charging spatial energy into time energy, and so you have to furnish rather enormous energy to get a little bit of that negative time charge reversed. After you fill that seemingly bottomless pit, then suddenly the negative time charge will have been eliminated, and at that point the battery will start to charge up in quite normal fashion. It is significant that Watson's battery was stolen right out of the machine. Whoever did it, almost certainly knew how to test it to find out if Watson's generator was actually a true over Unity device. If so, then they tested it and found that indeed it was genuine. And there was only one group there who would have known that little tidbit. Hitachi Magnetics Corporation, Magnet Motor. Engineers at Hitachi Magnetics Corporation have come right out and claimed that a motor run by magnets is feasible and logical, but the politics of the matter make it impossible for them to pursue developing a magnet motor or any device that would compete with the energy cartels. Among the obstacles to free energy are the big banks who own or finance the energy industries. Peter Lindemann offers an analysis of these obstacles in http colon slash slash www.wanttoknow.info slash new energy sources or http colon slash slash www.spiritofmat.com slash archive slash february 2 slash linda mnn dot htm Lindemann suggests that the four forces suppressing new energy devices are the world's wealthiest families and their banking institutions national governments striving to preserve national security, deluded inventors and con men, and the unspiritually motivated behavior of all the rest of us. Floyd Sweet, Vacuum Triode Amplifier Floyd Sweet had invented an advanced, solid-state, magnetic power converter called the Vacuum Triode Amplifier. If it could somehow be made stable over a long duration, it potentially offers an exceptionally high ratio of output power to input power in the range of 1 million. The somewhat unconventional physics of the device is explained in http colon slash slash rexresearch.com slash suite slash one nothing dot htm. 
The site also describes efforts to suppress Sweet's research and development efforts. Two people from Australia, who claimed they wanted to help Floyd, stole his notebook and promptly asked John Bedini for help in replicating the VTA based on the notebook contents. John recognized the notebook as belonging to Floyd and promptly asked them to leave. However, the notebook was never recovered. Sweet received many death threats over the phone and some threats face to face. A well-dressed gentleman in an expensive suit, tie, hat, and hundred-dollar shoes approached Sweet on the sidewalk of the street where he lived and introduced himself as Cecil Brown. Brown showed Sweet a photograph of Sweet inside his apartment. Brown then told Sweet that he represented a conglomerate that did not want Sweet's device to appear in the world at this time. Brown further stated that sometimes unfortunate things happen to people who do not comply with the wishes of others. Brown then retrieved the picture and departed. Gary Vesperman's file titled Bearden website on electrical energy includes these three excerpts written by Tom Bearden, a particularly good higher group symmetry electrodynamics, in this author's opinion, is the O3 electrodynamics founded by Evans and Vigier and further expounded by Evans. Evans has shown that O3 electrodynamics is a part of the Sachs Unified Field Theory electrodynamics. Thus O3 electrodynamics can be used not only for modeling normal electrodynamics but also for modeling exotic unified field theory. Further, it can be used for engineering so it permits the development of a drastically extended electromagnetic technology which can eventually engineer many new phenomena, including anti-gravitational effects. At least one highly successful anti-gravity experiment was performed by Sweet, in an experiment designed by the present author. The weight of an object was steadily reduced by 90%, on the laboratory bench. Sweet was fired at from about 300 yards by a would-be assassin, using a silenced rifle. Being old, he stumbled and fell on the steps just as the assassin pulled the trigger. The bullet snapped right by his ear, where his head had just been. Thereafter, Sweet was always deeply paranoid about taking the unit outside his own apartment or continuing to develop it. I personally worked with Sweet for some years. End of Bearden's report. Dr. Bearden provides more details on Sweet's interesting device in http colon slash 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 index dot php slash site colon lrp colon tom underscore bearden underscore remembers underscore walter underscore rosenthal underscore percent sign two six underscore floyd underscore sweet. John Bedini, schoolgirl motor and battery energizer. John Bedini, Idaho, designed the schoolgirl motor and battery energizer. Some years ago, three thugs came to his home and beat him severely. For a time he went underground and retracted all information on his devices. Chttp colon slash slash www.icehouse.net slash john34 slash html Two inventors, Model T4 generator with magnets added. About ten years ago, Two very clever backyard inventors took a magnetic, electricity generating flywheel off a Model T Ford, attached stationary magnets in a spiral arrangement to the outside, and developed a self generating motor generator, using the pulsed varying distance magnetic spiral principle. This generator continually produced 1600 watts of power with no other input. They demonstrated their Generator at UCLA confounding the professors, students and other observers. Evidently some heavy-handed U.S. government slash corporate types were in the audience, however, because the inventors never made it home from their demonstration. They were found dead along the highway. Their trailer, containing the generator, had disappeared. Apparently the Japanese now have the technology, which they are calling the magnetic wankel motor. Excerpted with permission from Eric Misson's article Suppression from Higher Up. Inventors Beware. The Deadly Campaign Against Free Energy Devices, Electrifying Times, Volume 8 Number 3, and also in http colon slash slash www.electrifyingtimes.com slash Eric Misson Suppression.html. Yasunori Takahashi, 
magnetic wankel motor. Yasunori Takahashi, the famous Japanese inventor who developed the beta video cassette recorder, has retrofitted his newly developed, super powerful YT magnets into his 15 horsepower magnetic wankel motor scooter, claiming he can obtain 15 horsepower from a few amperes of electricity. If the US government allows the Japanese to export these scooters to America, we will see a further trade deficit in Japan's favor. Rumor has it, however, that the U.S. government refused entry to the magnetic wankel motor in Mazda vehicles several years ago, just as it blocked Honda super high mileage, gas-powered cars at about the same time. Such protectionism may be good for business, at least for the oil companies and domestic auto manufacturers, but it hurts others and punishes the environment. Excerpted with permission from Eric Masson's article Suppression from Higher Up Inventors Beware. The Deadly Campaign Against Free Energy Devices, Electrifying Times, Volume 8 Number 3 and also in http colon slash slash www.electrifyingtimes.com slash suppression dot html. At the 1997 International Tesla Society Symposium in Colorado Springs, Colorado, John W. Moreland, Ph.D., a health physicist, lectured on his experiments with radiovoltaic electrical generators. Compare with photovoltaic generators such as solar panels. Paul Brown lectured separately on similar work based on converting cosmic rays to electricity. Brown had been working mainly to recreate T. Henry Moray's generator. Brown and Moreland found a strange quirk of ether physics involved with their over-unity electricity generating devices. It had been assumed by many, including Gary Vesperman as the basis for his advanced self-powered electric vehicle concept, that part of the output can be picked off and fed back directly to the input. The longest Moreland has been able to get his generator to run is three weeks. Then, the generator dissipates like a cat getting tired of chasing its tail. Brown and Moreland were still experimenting with voltage splitting, etc. Moreland said they may eventually have to take a generator's input and output out of the same time domain. For example, simply connect separate batteries to a generator's input and output. After talking with Moreland this writer, Gary Vesperman, got to thinking that for the self-powered electric vehicle, we could have a computer monitor battery charge levels and from time to time switch around between several sets of batteries. Simultaneously at all times, one battery set is being used for the motor, another set for the generator input, a third discharged set connected to the generator's output, plus possibly some spare batteries. When chatting with Moreland about electric vehicles, I mentioned the Takahashi over Unity motor mystery. June 1997 Hal Fox had sent me a copy of a 10-minute video showing Takahashi demonstrating his prototype over Unity magnetic motor, also known as a self-generating motor, magnetic wankel, with a drive belt turning an alternator. The motor is shown connected to a battery for starting the motor, and the battery is then shown disconnected. Two headlights, connected to the alternator's output terminals, remained illuminated after the battery was disconnected. A motorbike using the Takahashi over Unity motor was sent in 1996 from Japan to England and then to Mark Golds in Sebastopol, California for testing. Golds found that the motorbike had limited range, and the magnets were unremarkable. Nobody could understand why a man of Takahashi's stature and wealth would try to pull a scam. Moreland explained that the secret to the enormous strength of the Takahashi magnets, at 25,000 gauze the most powerful magnets ever developed, is that they contain uranium. The U.S. government forbids importing radioactive materials. For some reason, the radioactivity of the Takahashi magnets is being kept secret from the U.S. patent office until the Takahashi motor patents have been granted. So Takahashi had to substitute ordinary magnets for his super magnets in his motorbike motor. Thomas E. Bearden, Ph.D., understands that Takahashi's magnetic wankel motor has been suppressed by the Japanese Yakuza mob. Source
http colon slash slash com slash index dot php slash site colon lrp colon suppression colon underscore alternative underscore energy underscore systems colon underscore percent sign e2 percent sign eight zero percent sign nine c novel tie underscore of underscore fact percent e2 percent eighty percent nine d underscore freely underscore derived underscore sources this writer gary vesperman didn't follow Moreland's explanation during his symposium lecture how certain radioactive materials can enhance the magnetic field strength of a magnetic material. I had planned to write him for a reference that I could study. Unfortunately I lost touch with Moreland. Afterwards mainly because his website www.stechpub.com never was active. Teruo Kawaii, Motive Power Generating Device the key statement of Teru Okawaii's U.S. patent 5,436,518 for his motive power generating device is as follows, electric power of 19.55 watts was applied to the electromagnets at 17 volts and 1.15 amperes. An output of 62.16 watt was obtained. Dividing the output power by the input power yields a coefficient of performance of 3.19. Thomas E. Bearden, Ph.D., explained the Kawaii device's operation, placed his explanation on the Internet, and Kawaii and party came to Huntsville, Alabama to see him and his associates. At Kawaii's urging, they negotiated an agreement with him that they would manufacture and market his systems worldwide, he already had built a closed-loop, self-powering system in Japan. Kawaii would fund the entire project. Their agreement was verbally reached on a Thursday afternoon, late. That night a jet arrived post-haste from Los Angeles, with a Yakuza on board. The next morning Kawaii and his party were in fear and trembling, and the Yakuza was in total control. Kawaii no longer controlled his own company, his invention, or his own fate. Needless to say, the Yakuza coldly cancelled the agreement, point blank. This happened in front of Bearden and four associates. So there are five witnesses. The Yakuza and party quickly packed up the two Kawaii engines that were in the possession of Dr. Bearden and his associates, and departed. No Kawaii engine will ever be permitted on the world market. Several other Japanese COP greater than one electrical power systems have also been suppressed by the Yakuza. Many such incidents including murder have occurred over the last decades, right here in the United States. Others will happen. Source, http colon slash slash www.spiritofmat.com slash archive slash march 2 slash bearden dot htm right parenthesis Dr. Bearden, inventor of the motionless electromagnetic generator, see above, himself has been the subject of suppression efforts, including death threats. Source, http colon slash slash com slash index dot php slash site colon lrp colon suppression colon underscore alternative underscore energy underscore systems colon underscore percent sign e2 percent sign eight zero percent sign nine c novel tie underscore of underscore fact percent e2 percent eighty percent nine d underscore freely underscore derived underscore sources johan grander magnetic motor Johann Grander of Austria developed a revolutionary magnetic motor, but was turned down by the Austrian Patent Office with the excuse, inventions which are detrimental to products in existence may not be granted a patent. Eric Misson, Suppression of Quantum Leap Inventors, Electrifying Times, 2007. Volume 10, Number 2. IPMS Kiev and Arzimas, 16, Supermagnets. The evolution of the Soviet view of the material world was reflected in the formulation of a new model of nonlinear quantum mechanics as an implicit function of consciousness. For instance, water is more than just H20. Experiments prove water can be affected in measurable ways by subtle influences such as music or whether a person's thoughts are hate filled or life enhancing. A more correct understanding of materials has thus enabled supermagnets to be developed. In conjunction with research jointly conducted at the highly secretive laboratories at Arzimas, 16 in Hazakstan, IPMS Kiev has developed a family of magnets with energy characteristics equal to or exceeding those of the best conventional iron-boron neodymium types, 
but with the all-important feature that they operate with equal or greater efficiency at extremely high temperatures, up to 250 degrees centigrade. These magnets are so powerful that they have been successfully used to conduct extensive research in a perpetual zero-gravity environment. All these experiments have been performed without the use of cryogenics. Joint ventures of the IPMS with more than a dozen private sector companies to develop inventions were repeatedly sabotaged by the U.S. government's Defense Intelligence Agency and others. Source David G. Uerth the Anthropos Files, Tales of Quantum Physics from Another World 2nd Edition, 2007 General Motors Corporation, EV, One Electric Car Roger M. Ward was a two-time winner of the Indianapolis 500, National Stock Car Champion, and multiple winner of the USAC Racing Championship. In 1993 Ward registered with the State of Nevada a small corporate offering registration, score, for his American electric car company, include, whereby 200,000 shares of common stock were offered for sale at $5 per share. This writer, Gary Vesperman, wrote most of the score's disclosure document slash business plan. Ward's company had developed a new type of automatic transmission that will reduce the power required to propel the car and will allow a longer driving range between charges. His company also had developed a very efficient vacuum system to energize equipment such as power steering, power brakes, door locks, and windshield wipers that would ordinarily require electricity from the batteries used to power the electric motor. In addition, his company had added an extra lead acid battery to supply power to such accessories as the radio, heater, air conditioner, headlights, and tail lights. Thus the power drain of the accessories is isolated from the power used for the electric motor. Most interestingly, Ward's company had the right of first access, via Las Vegas-based Ashurst Technology Corporation, to a new type of battery invented by the IN. Francevic Institute of Problems of Materials Science, Kiev, Ukraine. Most types of batteries rely on electrochemical reactions. The Ukrainian crystal lattice battery stores the charges in crystalline layers of a sheet-like material similar in appearance to mica. Due to nonlinear quantum mechanic effects, the electrical characteristic of each crystalline layer is that of a capacitor as thin as less than one molecule. Since capacitance is inversely proportional to thickness of the separation between the layers, the Practical consequence of the crystal lattice battery is to electrically function in a manner similar to that of a giant capacitor. The positive contrasts of the crystal lattice battery with the lead acid battery are so striking as to justifiably portend a potential revolutionary advance for the electric car industry. Ward's company initially planned to use 1286 pound lead acid batteries weighing a total of approximately 1000 pounds. These lead acid batteries were to be replaced with 10 20 pound crystal lattice batteries, which would weigh a total of only about 200 pounds and thereby noticeably enhance driving performance. Lead acid batteries provide up to approximately 120 miles on a 4 to 5 hour recharge. The crystal lattice batteries could provide up to 400 miles on a 1 hour recharge. The crystal lattice batteries can supply constant voltage for up to 94% discharge. Since there is no heat nor waste product buildup as with electrochemical batteries, the crystal lattice batteries can easily last many hundreds of extremely rapid charge-slash-discharge cycles. The crystal lattice batteries operate well in the temperature range of minus 40 to plus 60 degrees centigrade. A side benefit of the crystal lattice batteries is that they are made only of materials which are environmentally friendly, plentiful, and inexpensive. While the IPMS did provide test samples about the size of a large flashlight battery, they were not able to deliver on their promised 20-pound crystal lattice batteries. The U.S. government's Defense Intelligence Agency had sabotaged the Ashurst Technology-slash-IPMS joint venture. So the American electric car company, include, lamentably failed to bring to market Ward's potentially revolutionary electric car. Roger Ward and Gary Vesperman became good friends. By the way, he drove in city traffic, cutting in and out, etc., like the famous race car driver that he is, not like a normal driver. 
Ward explained why the major automobile manufacturers as well as the oil companies suppress electric cars. Only 60% of their total profit is made when a car is sold. The dealers and manufacturers make the other 40% of their profit selling and replacing high-priced parts such as mufflers, fuel pumps, etc. Electric cars are too simple, durable and easily maintained. See his biography at http colon slash slash www.motortrend.com slash features slash auto news slash 112 news 040707 ward slash The significant profit advantage of gasoline cars over electric cars may be why as portrayed by the movie Who Killed the Electric Car, General Motors Corporation didn't fully support and eventually scrapped its EV, one electric car. To be fair, General Motors claims that it refused to sell its EV-1 electric car because it would be unable to ensure the safety and life of the vehicle after parts makers stopped supplying components. General Motors also claims that the EV-1 had difficulty running uphill and didn't offer air conditioning. GM does claim that its upcoming Volt electric slash gasoline car will be more advantageous than the EV-1. Because the Volt will still have a gasoline engine, the Volt should be complicated enough for General Motors to retain profit margins when maintenance labor and replacement parts are sold. The complicated gasoline-powered car is fundamentally unreliable and unnecessarily expensive to fuel and maintain. It has required heroic engineering efforts to partly overcome its inherent impracticality. Within about a year after writing the disclosure document for Ward's company's score, this writer also wrote Nevada scores for natural environmental solutions, include, NISI, and Aimright Systems International, Inc. NISI had acquired the rights to Frank Richardson's magnet-based electrical generator that required no input power and also a bladeless Tesla-type steam turbine, see above. Aimright Systems had patented computer-controlled hydraulic shock absorbers and a computer-controlled air ride suspension system. I have ridden a test bus equipped with an aim right suspension. Nice ride. I introduced Roger Ward to prolific Las Vegas inventor Alvin Snaper. Snaper has 600 patents, processes, and innovations such as the type font ball in the IBM Selectric typewriter and Tang the Orange. Juice drink. Ward became enthusiastic with Snaper's demonstration of a prototype of Snaper's invention of a compressed air-driven air conditioner slash heater. It relies on the principle of a vortex tube. Air world in. A vortex tube separates with the cold air molecules collecting in one portion of the tube, and the warm air. Molecules collecting in another portion of the tube. The cold air is expelled from one end of the tube, and the warm air is expelled from the other end. It can be switched between providing 90% cold air and 10% warm air, or 10% cold air and 90% warm air. The metal tube is about a foot long and a half inch in diameter with a 2 inch long compressed air intake tube perpendicularly attached about 3 inches from one end. The intake compressed air requirement specifications are 7 CFM at 40 psi. The volume of air expelled is twice that of a refrigerant-type automobile air conditioner while requiring only one-fourth the horsepower. Also, no warm-up period is required as with conventional air conditioners or heaters. Its efficiency is nearly 30%. Alvin Snaper also had invented a low-temperature non-destructive process for increasing the durability of vehicle parts and tools with diamond or titanium nitride. A few years later, Snaper invented a high-performance nickel-iron battery very suitable for electric vehicles. The Ukraine's IPMS had also invented a basalt-slash-carbon fiber foam which is extremely strong yet lighter than fiberglass. A test vehicle made with basalt-slash-carbon fiber foam parts was reportedly the only vehicle ever tested that can cut through a cast-iron London taxicab in a collision. See below, IPMS, High Temperature Gas Plasma Detonator. Just for fun, I then combined these technologies into an advanced self-powered electric vehicle concept. A current version with more details and additional technologies is available in the category Speculative Advanced Electric Vehicle Concept HTTP colon slash slash www.3c.de slash docs slash gv short summaries 1-46a.htm
In addition, at a public meeting, September 14, 2005, held in Green Valley Ranch Casino, Henderson, Nevada, regarding the proposed regional fixed guideway traversing Las Vegas, Nevada, I submitted suggestions for possible power sources for the train, most of which also seem suitable for self-powered sources for vehicles, chttp colon slash slash www.rtcsouthernnevada.com slash rfg slash documents slash september 2005 public meeting minutes dot pdf right parenthesis comma pages 9 to 77 the pulsed abnormal glow discharge pagd reactor uses high density charge clusters to produce useful positive ac to dc electrical power conversion gains such as 483 percent it's an oversized glass vacuum tube which is constructed and electrically driven within a narrow range of DC voltage so that it operates with negative resistance. Dr. Paolo and Alexandra Correa, New Energy Electric Power Now. Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharge Technology, Infinite Energy, Cold Fusion and New Energy Technology Volume 2, Number 7, March-April 1996, P18. Gary Vesperman's compilation of advanced technologies for foreign resort project in http colon slash slash www.isistuff.com slash tilde energy 21 slash adv and tech.htm includes a chapter on the pulsed abnormal glow discharge reactor. U.S. Patent 5416391 for electromechanical transduction of plasma pulses. U.S. Patent 5,449,989 for Energy Conversion System. U.S. Patent 5,502,354 for Direct Current Energized Pulse Generator Utilizing. Autogenous Cyclical Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharges. Paolo N. and Alexandra and Korea, Ontario. The Koreas have demonstrated one kilowatt outputs and have run motors under load with these pulsed abnormal glow discharge reactors. General Motors was interested in the pulsed abnormal glow discharge reactor, as the company's electrical engineers loved it. Upper management killed it, and told the Koreas, the electric car is window dressing. IPMS, Energy Storage Slash Battery Devices During the summer of 1984, Airborne intelligence surveillance teams of the United States Air Force, operating out of specially configured and equipped Boeing 707 airframes, called AWACs, electronically detected, and then shortly thereafter photographed, bursts of coherent light of enormous power originating in the vicinity of Dusum Bay, Turkmenistan. The bursts of light, a brilliant blue-green color, lasted just a few seconds and were shifted almost to the ultraviolet end of the light spectrum. The laser beams were directed upwards out of the atmosphere towards American military communications satellites. At precisely the same time the AWACs detected and photographed the laser bursts, they were referred to in that jargon by American military analysts but later proved to be something almost entirely different, Several of the satellites essential to America's global military command and control communications systems became inexplicably inoperable. The Defense Intelligence Agency, under the direction of the National Security Council and assisted by the National Security Agency, escalated its surveillance of the remote site in the Ural Mountains from which the bursts first originated. For several months, during a concerted campaign of uninterrupted observation by AWACs and American spy satellites, no additional bursts were observed or reported. Then, without warning, in the middle of the night nearly seven months later, AWACs crews operating just outside the territorial airspace of Afghanistan detected similar laser bursts of lower intensity during a period of intensive localized ground warfare. The Afghanistan bursts were apparently aimed at targets under attack by Soviet infantry units. The laser bursts continued in a sustained, localized but obviously mobile attack pattern, as frequently as four or five times per hour, until nearly sunset of the next day. Photographic evidence gathered at the time by the AWAC screw, and later corroborated by photographs taken at the actual site of the firefight and forwarded to the US for analysis, showed that the targets of the laser bursts were ammunition and fuel supply depots located in the remote desert. 
several of the ammunition and fuel caches had apparently been destroyed during the attack, as demonstrated by the evidence of explosions, fire, smoke and residual infrared heat patterns detected, photographed and electronically recorded on board the AWACs. All this information was transmitted, via encrypted communications bursts, routed through the Military Global Command Control Satellite System, to the National Security Agency, NSA, located at Fort Meade, Maryland. Analysts there recognized that they were looking at evidence of a weapon system which had never been observed before. They did not know what had produced the laser bursts. But they did know that the technology which made such a thing possible was not available to the countries participating in the NATO Convention. They were terrified at the implications of such a development. Within hours, the information was packaged into classified documents and conveyed to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Joint Chiefs examined the information while they were being briefed by the AWAC's crews which had witnessed and recorded the events. After the briefing, the crews were dismantled, and their various members stationed far away from one another, with orders never to discuss the events they had witnessed. Officially, the laser bursts never had occurred. Secretary of Defense Frank Carlucci took delivery of the packet at his residence in Falls Church, Virginia, three days later, at a private, secret meeting held in the middle of the night. No one has yet adequately explained why the Joint Chiefs waited three full days to brief the Secretary. Early the next morning, he was driven in a specially prepared bulletproof limousine to the White House. He personally delivered the information to the new President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. The content of the Secretary's report had an immediate, measurable impact. It was the series of events which principally precipitated the Strategic Defense Initiative, a program of military defense and reprisal based on America's state-of-the-art satellite-borne laser optical and particle accelerator technologies. The SDI system was intended to provide the U.S. with a meaningful deterrent to further aggressive use of the technology developed by the Soviet military. There was only one problem with this system, Aside from the fact that its astronomical costs almost bankrupted the American economy, it did not work. SDI was designed to respond to a kind of technology which was not achievable in the West, and which could not be explained by any of the models, materials, technologies or sciences known in the West. In 1985, the top-secret military version of the space shuttle, codenamed Atlantis, embarked on a special orbital mission. One of its mission assignments was to retrieve, examine or photograph the military spy satellites which had been disabled by the laser bursts recorded in 1979-84. The results of this investigation have not been declassified or released in any but the most censored version to the public. What we do know for certain, as a matter of publicly available non-classified information, however, is that each of the disabled satellites appeared to have had at least one, and in some cases as many as four or five precisely measured holes, approximately the size of an American silver dollar, melted completely through them from the outside. The photographs taken of the satellites show evidence of intense heat, charring and carbonized residue evenly distributed around the perimeter of each hole. The evidence is clear and unmistakable the satellites were disabled by a coherent beam of some sort, characterized by such intense energy that it was possible to melt consistently measured holes through the exterior and interior components of American military satellites, after having passed through the atmosphere of the planet and into space for as many as 325 miles. Such a thing has scarcely been dreamed of by the American military, much less put into any but the most nominally effective operational form. After more than 10 years of political, economic and technological wrangling, and after the expenditure of more than $120 billion in largely ineffectual research and development efforts, it is inescapably clear that no amount of money or political pressure, no amount of geopolitical posturing or economic sanctions was going to compel the disclosure or replication of the technologies which produced the results photographed over the Carpathian Mountains and the Afghanistan deserts. The Soviets had developed a weapon system which was so revolutionary that it could not be explained, replicated or defended against. 
the Reagan administration's lack of specificity about the nature of the implied threat to which SDI was supposed to respond subjected the administration, the Defense Department and the R&D proponents of the most prominent American aerospace corporations to an endless barrage of charges by the press and the Congress. They were characterized as being disingenuous and accused of being unreasonably secretive during successive appropriations battles in the Congress. The truth of matter is that the administration and the Pentagon were not being disingenuous at all. They simply could not admit to the American public that they were attempting to develop an effective response to a weapons system which they did not understand and could not replicate. There are a number of issues intrinsic to the set of circumstances, along with several dozen others which, though less well known or economically dramatic, are no less important from a technological standpoint. It is certain that the implication of these technologies has not been lost on those multinational corporations whose entire capital structure may be threatened by the new sciences, technologies and materials which have been developed in secret laboratories, hidden in caverns excavated beneath the Carpathian Mountains, in the former Soviet Union. Over the past decade the West has enjoyed occasional gratuitous glimpses into the heart of Soviet science. Attempts to disclose or discuss these developments in the press have been ruthlessly suppressed by powerful special interests vested in both the public and private sectors. The science which underlies the series of events recounted here remains at the outer limits of the most advanced technology of which the West is capable. The questions posed by the military and corporate analysts about this laser beam weapons system are far-reaching in their scope and implications. Some of them are illustrative. One new model of quantum mechanics, the sciences and models of quantum mechanics which produced such stunning recent developments in the West as the laser and maser make quite clear how much energy is required to create a beam of coherent light powerful enough to penetrate the atmosphere, retain its coherence in spite of atmospheric diffraction, and other effects described in quantum mechanics as thermal blooming, and melt a two-inch hole clear through it. Satellite made of the most sophisticated alloys ever produced in the West. Except for limited short-distance demonstrations conducted with industrial-grade lasers used in cutting operations, there is no known combination of materials or technologies extant in the West to make such a thing possible. 2. New materials, the materials necessary to create an electrical charge large enough to power a device capable of producing such a beam certainly do exist. In quantum mechanics the term large enough does not make sense, but we can agree for the purposes of this discussion on the effect of it as represented by such commonly accepted constructs as frequency, voltage, current and ionic flow rates as distinguished by the phenomenon of resistance. Hydroelectric plants and large, fixed base nuclear power plants are capable of producing enough energy to theoretically power such a device but the energy bursts in both the Carpathians and the Afghan. Desert were generated by sources which moved from one location to another. In order to do that, several additional considerations must be addressed, portability, the power source would have to be transportable or be capable of storing sufficient energy to repeatedly power such a device. Western technology cannot produce either a portable power production unit or energy storage system capable of the performance requirements everyone agrees must be met to make the weapons system work, either in the laboratory or in the field. System portability was the most puzzling feature of the nsa dia report. When carefully analyzed, the computer-enhanced enlargements of the photographs taken by the spy satellites and AWAC's crews failed to provide evidence of any tracks which could be attributed to wheeled or tracked vehicles operating in the precise locations and at the same time as the laser bursts which were observed. The implications of this set of circumstances was almost too much to believe the devices were apparently either handheld or transportable and rechargeable in such a way as to allow them to be transported by one or more foot soldiers, without vehicular support. b. Enormous power requirement, the materials and technologies used to construct a device capable of generating a beam of such enormous power and magnitude would have to be sufficiently advanced to enable the components to be transported without damage over significant distances in unpaved areas of very rough terrain. Such strategies, engineering techniques, 
construction technologies or materials do not exist in the Western inventory. C. The continuous repetition of the laser bursts suggests that the devices can be operated repeatedly at short intervals of 12 to 15 minutes. This means they can be triggered with significantly higher frequency and intensity than anything which can be produced in the West, even for laboratory use. Industrial strength lasers used to cut metals require careful setup, accommodate only limited use in short bursts, require extensive cooling and must be continually recalibrated. These limitations obviously did not apply to the devices being operated in the Afghan desert. Analysts at AMTL agreed that the units would either have to be recharged via an external, independent device or somehow be capable of self-recharging in the field. Such a thing is almost unthinkable by current Western military standards. Not only can we still not replicate the technology in any meaningful form, but the Soviets had refined the technology to a point which allowed it to be carried on the shoulders of ordinary foot soldiers and recharged in the field without motorized support. Unbelievable! How was such a thing possible? According to some of the highly qualified scientists who scrutinized the photographs, it is not possible. The not invented here syndrome is alive and well in the American engineering community. Some of them still insist that the pictures were either fabricated or demonstrate something completely different than this narrative suggests. 3. Energy Recharge Batteries How did such high-intensity laser beam generators get recharged in the middle of the Afghan desert, in the absence of powered support vehicles or fixed-based power plants? There are a number of possible alternatives. They could have been powered by some sort of advanced battery technology. It's possible, but if the battery technology used in the West is used as a model to support such a thesis, it would take a bank of the most sophisticated batteries ever designed by NASA, arrayed in series and parallel configurations larger than five full-sized Soviet T-60 Tiger tanks to power such a device. This theoretical battery bank, operating at 100% efficiency, which is not practically or theoretically possible, the best batteries manufactured in the West operate at less than 60% discharge efficiency, could conceivably produce enough direct current voltage, in a zero-resistance superconductive circuit, which is not possible, either, to perhaps produce one burst of light equal in intensity to 20% of the power required to burn a 2-inch hole through a satellite moving at 20,000 miles per hour at a distance of 325 miles. Soviet ground forces were generating bursts of this magnitude every 12 to 15 minutes for more than 10 hours with nothing but ground troops. During 8 hours of this exchange, it was totally dark. Something pretty remarkable must have been going on to make such a thing possible. 4. Energy Recharge Solar Cells Another alternative would have been to have whatever energy storage devices were being used to power the laser cannons recharged by sunlight. The state of the art in photovoltaic cells produced in the West simply would not support such an undertaking. The very best solar cells ever produced in the West have been produced by the Japanese. These cells operate at a maximum of 19% efficiency, that is, they convert as much as 19% of the ambient visible sunlight shining on a clear, cloudless day into ion flow, which then becomes low voltage direct electrical current flowing through a circuit. The Japanese panels require months per section to manufacture and literally cost more than their weight in gold to manufacture. They are very heavy and are so sensitive to vibration and calibration that once installed, they cannot be moved at all. Photovoltaic cells capable of providing enough electricity to recharge a theoretically infinite energy well would have to operate at efficiencies of 50 to 80 percent to recharge batteries of infinite electrical capacity with enough power to trigger such a device. Such cells would have to be very lightweight and able to withstand extremes of heat, cold, vibration, dust, wind and other conditions encountered in a hostile battlefield environment. Nothing like that exists in the Western technological arsenal. Dielectric materials transformers and capacitors, another consideration must be reconciled before this issue can be theoretically put to rest. In order to produce a burst of coherent light of sufficient intensity to have the effect which was observed and recorded by the surveillance teams, 
the voltage and amperage required to support such a device would have to be staggeringly high. In order to operate at all, the voltage supplied to the system must be released all at once, not in a continuous stream but in a single coherent burst so intense that any materials known in the West would either evaporate or melt. Not only would the best dielectric materials known to Western science melt because of the heat produced by such enormous energy bursts, but before a bolt of energy of this magnitude could even be released to such a device, it would have to be accumulated and stored somehow. A similar set of requirements of a less dramatic type is present in all the electronic devices manufactured and marketed in the West. This includes the entire range of electronic devices such as VCRs, computers, televisions and sound components, telecommunications, information storage, transmission and retrieval systems of every kind. We could not live as we do without them. The components which convert, store and release ion flow into the circuitry of these devices are known as transistors, transformers and capacitors. This discussion delves into a slightly technical area here, so non-scientific types will need to either become familiar with the fundamentals of electricity to understand what is meant or simply give it a possibility that what is developed in the next section is a true representation of the way such things actually operate. The discussion deals with such commonly used and seldom understood concepts as voltage, current, frequencies and resistance. A. Transformers convert voltage at one level of current, amperage, to either higher or lower voltage levels. When the voltage is increased, the amperage or current is proportionately decreased. A low voltage produced at a high current level can be transformed into a much higher voltage at a proportionately lower level of current or power. b. Capacitors, the decrease in amperage which accompanies a transformation of low voltage to higher voltage is often compensated for by a device known as a capacitor. In the most simplistic terms, capacitors store electrical energy until the amount of voltage and current reach a certain minimal threshold. When that point is reached, the entire store of energy is released all at once in a single burst. The tantalum materials used in the West to manufacture such devices conform to certain standard rules which are commonly accepted by electrical engineers. These rules have only recently been stretched by new technologies and materials developed in the West. For the purposes of this discussion, though, it is safe to say that electrical engineers have long relied on these rules because they have always produced the same results when applied in the same way. Here's an example. It is standard engineering fare which dictates that a transformer capable of accommodating 1 volt at 1 ampere of current across a grid of 1 ohm of resistance will be 1 cubic meter in dimension. If followed to its logical conclusion, this standard rule of electrical engineering would require that a transformer capable of supporting a laser burst device of the kind operated by the Soviet ground forces in the Afghan desert would have to be approximately the size of a building built on a base 100 feet to a side, nearly 150 feet high. Surely such a device could not have been hidden from the AWAC sci in the sky which can clearly photograph the letters on a license plate from 60,000 feet altitude nor could it have been moved on the shoulders of ground troops without wheeled vehicular support. The fact that there was absolutely no trace of such a huge, massive transformer device, or any other kind of structure or vehicle which could be construed to serve that purpose, means that something else must have been used instead. Military analysts had absolutely no idea what it could have been. Such a burst system cannot operate without a capacitor of some sort. A capacitive device capable of storing the amount of energy required to power a single burst from a laser cannon, made of the most advanced dielectric material known in the West, would have to have been equally massive and, further, would have to have been cooled by some sort of strategy which would have been instantly and unmistakably detected by the infrared cameras and spectroscopic scanners used aboard the AWACs and the spy satellites which investigated the scene. The practical requirements of such a system are best demonstrated by the massive equipment required to operate and cool the superconductor supercollider linear particle accelerators recently designed by the United States and Japan. 
no evidence of any such capacitive device was recorded in either the Carpathian Mountains or the Afghanistan Desert. How can we explain it? Without going into any detail about how the technologies were developed, suffice it for now to say that the Soviet ground forces in Afghanistan were equipped with a prototype of a handheld plasma beam accelerator, the likes of which had only been roughly imagined by American military analysts. The device relied on some innovative strategies. Among these were, energy storage devices, the power source for the Soviet light cannons was comprised of a backpack array of specially designed energy storage devices. The closest thing we have in our vocabulary to compare to them is described by the term battery. In the limited sense that these devices store electrical energy, they are batteries. Any other similarity to the batteries we are accustomed to in the West ends there. The literal translation of the Russian name for them is energy accumulators. The batteries relied on in the West are based on the chemical properties of components which, when combined in certain configurations and proportions, interact chemically with one another. The result of this chemical interaction is that it creates both heat and a stream of liberated ions electricity. In dry cell batteries, the process of chemical interaction is one way once they have been expended, they are simply disposed of. It is estimated that more than 12 billion expended dry cell and lead acid batteries are dumped into America's landfills every year. A consortium of aerospace companies working with NASA recently announced the development of an advanced sodium hydride-based rechargeable cell which is the most efficient battery yet invented in the West. Unfortunately, it operates at an ambient temperature of 2000 degrees centigrade and, if allowed, to reach temperatures outside a very narrow safe operating zone, will explode with the force of a small thermonuclear device of approximately 10 kiloton yield. It is not safe, but it is the best Western science has come up with. The energy storage device developed by the IN. Francevic Institute for Problems of Materials. Science, IPMS, Kiev, Ukraine, works on a completely different principle. Its construction is the result of a completely unique nonlinear quantum mechanical model which makes it possible to create crystalline lattices of absolutely pure carbon, and other materials, in sheets of infinitely variable dimension which are exactly one molecule thick. The crystal formation techniques and the whole body of new science which allows for their creation in the first place are completely unknown to Western science. The monomolecular sheets deposited by this technique are wrapped back and forth on top of each other, more than one million times per millimeter, and are separated from each other by a distance of less than one atomic diameter. At this level of construction, the material becomes subject to the rules of quantum mechanics which are almost entirely probabilistic. That means a whole atom of carbon, or almost anything else except an electron or photon, will not fit in the space which separates the lattice. Sheets When viewed under an electron microscope, the sheets produce a pattern which looks for all the world like an endless field of four-sided pyramids, connected base to base, on a single plane, with the tips of the pyramids protruding endlessly, uniformly upwards. When wrapped back and forth on top of each other, these sheets of pure carbon crystal, made of carbon molecules shaped like trillions of identical tiny pyramids, all arrayed endlessly in identical formation, are positioned so that the tips of the pyramids on the bottom sheet are matched with the tips of the pyramids on the top sheets. What remains between the pyramid tips are open spaces or energy wells. The quantum physics which describes the characteristics of the energy wells created between the layers of crystalline lattice is largely unknown to Western physicists. The Soviet model predicts with a high degree of probability that the quanta of energy referred to in the West as electrons, and, in some cases, photons, the stuff of which electricity is made, will, when introduced to the lattice structure, search, find and fit into the energy wells with military precision. During the recharging or loading phase, the energy storage devices made of the crystalline lattice material channel one electron at a time into each well created by four carbon pyramids on the bottom layer and four carbon pyramids on the top layer. Because the rules of quantum mechanics which operate in this tiny environment demand it, 
each electron or quanta of energy has a certain polarity, spin and color, and other mathematically defined characteristics, which must be accommodated if it is to find, fit and stay in an energy well. Interestingly enough, when a current is applied across the latticework structure, the electrons behave precisely as nonlinear quantum mechanics predicts they will. They flow much like a fluid into the lattice field, then separate into individual energy quanta and spin into the last energy well in each layer, automatically adjusting their individual spin, polarity and color to match their characteristics to fit the requirements of each well, until the lattice is full. Because no chemical reactions are involved in the process of marching electrons into or out of the energy well fields, there is no resistance in the circuit. In the absence of resistance, the electrons fill the wells at light speed, never missing a space, automatically adjusting polarity, spin and other characteristics, and creating no heat. The amount of time required to charge such a cell is less than 5% of the time required to recharge a conventional chemical battery of similar voltage and current. The validity of E equal MC2 is called into question by the way these devices function. When the battery is fully charged, it actually demonstrates more mass than when the energy storage device is empty or discharged. The laws of quantum mechanics relied on in the West state categorically that this is not possible. It is the answer to the question, how much does a beam of light weigh? According to the Soviet model, this is precisely as it should be. When this phenomenon was first demonstrated to scientists in the West who were testing the energy storage devices at INEEL in Idaho, they were thunderstruck. The quanta of energy, or electrons as we refer to them, which are poured into the Crystalline lattice demonstrate characteristics of mass even though they are bundles of pure energy sitting in stasis, literally at rest. The characteristic of mass is verifiable you can measure it by weighing the energy storage devices before and after they are charged. When they are charged, they demonstrate appreciably more mass than when they are fully discharged. If this is confusing to you, to suggest that pure energy can be shown to demonstrate verifiable mass while at rest, in stasis, perhaps you can begin to appreciate how fundamentally different the physics of all this is when viewed in the terms of Einstein's classic equation E equal mc2. The existence of this technology clearly is proof positive that not only does energy demonstrate the characteristics of mass, but it does so in a state of non-motion or stasis, sitting idly in an energy well. A state of stasis is a very far cry from the terminal theoretical velocity required by the constant in Einstein's equation, equivalent to the square of the speed of light. The scientific implications of this phenomenon are truly staggering. At very least, the verification of mass as a property of energy quanta at rest suggests that Einstein's theory of relativity may be altogether incorrect as a means of describing the dynamics underlying the real nature of the material world and its relationship to energy. The existence of this technology suggests, at very least, that energy and mass are equivalent characteristics of all things which are manifest in the material world. It is this fundamental contextual difference which distinguishes the Soviet model of quantum mechanics from the Western model. The proof of the pudding, they say, is in the eating. Theoretical physicists may argue endlessly about the validity of the assumptions relied on by the IPMS scientists to develop their unique sciences, technologies and materials. But they cannot argue about the existence of the materials which have arisen from that context. They are as real as they can be and they are unlike anything ever seen or contemplated in the West. In the same way energy quanta stored in the energy wells of crystalline lattice materials demonstrate complete mathematical satisfaction with staying there indefinitely, when allowed to flow out in the form of an outgoing wave of electrical discharge, these quanta, electrons or photons, as you prefer, march right back out without resistance at light speed through a closed circuit to another use. When these energy storage devices are discharged, they demonstrate other attributes which are not known in Western science, and which, because of the very nature of the chemical reactions we are accustomed to, are not theoretically possible according to conventional wisdom. Conventional chemical batteries, when fully charged, 
produce electric current at a usable voltage for perhaps 30 to 40 percent of the total discharge cycle. After that, either the voltage or amperage, or both, drop to low enough levels that the devices being powered by them cannot recognize or use the electrical current which remains available. At that point, the batteries either have to be recharged or replaced. The crystal lattice batteries have been demonstrated to produce precisely the same current and voltage levels throughout 98% of their discharge cycle. They produce no heat during discharge, regardless of the rate at which they are discharged. This is absolutely contrary to our experience with batteries, transformers or capacitors. Until the crystalline lattice materials were specifically engineered to register an electronically detectable blip at 95-96% to 96 discharge, it was impossible even for the scientists who developed them to distinguish a partially discharged battery from a fully charged one. There is another characteristic which is intrinsic to energy storage devices which comes into play here. It is a characteristic of materials which is described as energy density. For non-scientific readers, this concept can simply be construed to mean the amount of measurable electrical current which can be produced by any device or material when its mass is converted into electrical energy. The concept is expressed in mathematical formulas as the number of watts and hours of consumable energy which can be converted from each kilogram of material. It is expressed as watt hours per kilogram. Here is an example we can all understand. Consider gasoline. When converted into electrical power. At 100% efficiency, gasoline has been theoretically shown to have an energy density of between 5500 and 6000 watt hours per kilogram of mass. In easy terms, that means that if 1 kilogram of gasoline were converted into pure electricity at 100% efficiency, with no loss due to heat, resistance, waste, etc., the reservoir of energy would power a 100 watt light bulb for 55 to 60 hours most of the high-end conventional automobile batteries of the lead acid variety operate at an energy density rate of between 20 to 25 watt hours per kilogram the best nasa sodium hydride batteries operate at 48 to 50 watt hours per kilogram the energy accumulator devices which have been tested at the Idaho National Electronic Laboratories have demonstrated energy densities of between 8500 and 10500 watt hours per kilogram. What does this mean in practical terms? It means, for one thing, that for the first time in the history of science an energy storage device has been created with an energy density which is greater than gasoline or any other refined fossil fuel. It means that devices which rely on these energy storage technologies can theoretically be designed to store and deliver clean electrical power at higher rates of efficiency than any fossil fuel ever discovered. The global implications of this technology are irresistible. It means, among other things, that the technology exists, right now, to eliminate the need to build another nuclear power plant or dam another river to produce hydroelectric power. It means we can no longer justify burning another ounce of petroleum, another piece of coal, another cubic centimeter of natural, or unnatural gas, or another tree to produce heat, electricity or power for any purpose, including transportation. When coupled with the plasma beam devices being tested by the Soviet infantry units in Afghanistan, these energy storage devices operated at such unbelievably high rates of discharge efficiency that they made it possible to repeatedly induce huge electrical discharges in a highly mobile configuration. The same technologies which were used to produce the energy storage devices have been adapted to create transformers and capacitors with previously unimaginable performance characteristics. Instead of adhering to the conventional Western model of 1 volt at 1 amp across a resistance of 1 ohm equals 1 cubic meter, the Soviets have produced a capacitor which measures more than 1200 farads at 10,000 amperes in a package the size of a tuna sandwich. When tested by the Technology Materials Testing Laboratory of the Defense Department at the Pentagon and at the INEEL in Idaho, totally new testing equipment had to be designed engineered and constructed just to test the devices. 
the scientists at those laboratories had never tested anything like these materials before. Instead of having to house transformer and capacitor devices in a series of trailers towed by diesel tractors or huge fixed base facilities, the operating apparatus which supplied transformed power and high-intensity capacitive bursts to the light cannons weighed less than 10 pounds and could easily be transported in a backpack by a foot soldier. One final question remains unanswered. How did the energy storage devices, once dissipated or discharged, become recharged in the field, especially in the dark of night? The backpack plasma beam device detected by the AWACs during limited combat use in the Afghanistan desert was powered by energy storage devices constructed of crystalline lattice materials. After each laser burst, the energy storage devices were recharged every 12 to 15 minutes, nearly 45 minutes in the dark of night the residual ambient heat of the desert is a very efficient source of infrared energy, by sunlight, collected and converted to electricity by four-foot square panels of solar cell material arrayed on a pole like a flag, each weighing less than 10 ounces. The electrical energy stored in the backpack energy accumulators was transformed into enormously high voltages and released at almost unbelievably high current levels when the supercapacitors were sufficiently charged. The beam of light detected by the AWAC screws was a field of plasma, flowing at the speed of light and demonstrating characteristics of mass, and, therefore, kinetic energy. The phenomenon represented by these bolts of lightning are not comprehensible according to the model of quantum mechanics and plasma physics currently being used in the West. Battery packs utilizing these energy accumulator materials have been designed, produced and tested which provide more than 14 hours of continuously transmitted power on a single charge to conventional handheld cellular telephone devices. Similar improvements in conventional battery slash energy storage capacity have been developed and are being tested for such devices as video camcorders, laptop and portable computers and other similar consumer, commercial, industrial and military applications. IPMS research in the field of layered crystals has thus led to the creation of capacitors with a very high level of capacitance, measured in farads. This technology is based on a revolutionary production technique which forms polarized surfaces of one molecule thickness, separated by less than one atomic diameter of space, held together by weak van der Waals energy forces. The special properties created by these layered crystalline structures provide previously unimaginable internal surface areas. Supercapacitors are constructed of layered materials numbering more than 1 million dipole sheets for each millimeter of crystal thickness. These devices provide a virtually limitless number of charge-discharge cycles at astonishingly rapid charge and discharge rates. The potential impact of such devices on all electronic equipment currently being produced is incalculable, since virtually all electronic devices rely extensively on the West state of the art tantalum capacitance technologies. At present, IPMS has on hand, among others, a supercapacitor roughly the size and dimension of a sandwich which develops more than 1,200 farads at 10,000 amperes. It also boasts production of a battery whose active mass energy density exceeds 850 watt-hours per kilogram. For the non-scientist, and all the rest of us as well, this means that a battery has been produced which, for the first time in history, produces more power per unit of mass than any fossil fuel ever devised. Prototype testing of larger scale devices designed specifically for providing power to electric vehicles is currently underway. Prototypes are expected to be capable of sustained highway speeds of up to 70 miles per hour with a range of 525 miles on a single charge. The power plant for this application has been recently improved by the inclusion of a proprietary solid-state ceramic electric motor which weighs 7.2 kilograms and produces 100 horsepower on 12 volt direct current. For comparison, an electric vehicle employing a 100, horsepower electric motor performs the same as with a 500 horsepower gasoline engine if these performance attainments can be sustained in broad-based applications electrically powered vehicles could be produced which would meet or exceed virtually all performance characteristics currently available in equipment relying on internal combustion petroleum-based engines 
gasoline-slash-diesel-powered transportation devices can be replaced by cleaner, more efficient and significantly less expensive alternatives. The world market for current energy storage applications which will be superseded by these energy storage technologies is estimated to be in excess of $24 billion per year, 1991, exclusive of electric vehicle considerations. Joint ventures of the IPMS with more than a dozen private sector companies to develop useful energy inventions have been repeatedly sabotaged by the U.S. government's Defense Intelligence Agency and others. Source, David G. Uth, The Anthropos Files, Tales of Quantum Physics from Another World 2nd Edition, 2007. IPMS, High Temperature Gas Plasma Detonator. Since its establishment in 1951, the IN Francevic Institute for Problems of Materials Science, IPMS, Kiev, Ukraine, has been secretly developing, testing and producing more than 130 new materials in 30 general materials categories. IPMS scientists have developed a whole new science based on their unique model of plasma physics. With their invention of a high-temperature gas plasma detonator, Strategic metals and other commonly used materials can literally be sprayed onto the surface of other, previously incompatible materials. These gas plasma detonation spray technologies make it possible to create permanent molecular bonds between materials which could never be married together before. Chromium materials of an entirely new type have been developed to provide high purity cathodes and targets. Moldable, flexible chromium, a type of material never before available, can now literally be sprayed to conform to widely varying shapes for linings, i.e., to reduce internal pipe corrosion, provide nuclear rod protection, and highly effective space hardening. These techniques have been perfected and used in practical field applications for more than 35 years. The unique nature of these technologies may not be readily apparent to those not intimately familiar with the commercial and industrial uses of such materials. In more ordinary applications, however, the importance of being able to provide solid targets, standalone ingots of ultra-pure chromium, scandium, magnesium and other exotic materials, cannot be overstated. Today, the state of the art in the West only allows chromium, for example, to be transported and used while in solution with other highly toxic liquids. Western scientists do not have the ability to produce freestanding ingots of any of these materials. The manufacturing models which rely on Western science make it clear that it is not theoretically possible for such materials to be produced in a freestanding form. Similar materials coupled with the technologies of high-temperature gas plasma detonation have been developed for coating internal combustion engine parts to extend life cycle. They have been applied to enhance the performance characteristics of memory elements for computers and to support an extraordinary variety of totally new electronic circuitry. This technology has been successfully used to produce computer circuit boards whose operating components are intrinsic to the circuitry, thereby eliminating the utility or need for soldering or pin housings. The use of scandium, a very rare and exotic element available only in the Carpathian Mountains of Ukraine, make much of this possible in ways not anticipated by Western science. IPMS Kiev scientists have developed a series of diamond and cubic boron nitride powders which are smaller and more uniform than any other manufactured today. Also available in this family of materials are very fine, sometimes monomolecular, ultra-high purity powders and liquids of refractory metals including chromium, vanadium, tungsten, scandium and molybdenum. These powders can literally be sprayed as a plasma field to form continuous, seamless, flexible molecular bonds with host surfaces without electrolytic processes. These materials demonstrate clearly superior performance in tool hardening, cutting-edge equipment and polishing. IPMS Chernovitsky scientists have developed an entire family of previously unknown technologies based on woven fibers made entirely of 100% pure basalt fibers, lava rock. This totally new technology allows for the production of flexible, weavable threads. These fibers are fundamentally resistant to heat, 
demonstrating a softening point in excess of 800 degrees centigrade. Fibers of this material have been produced in diameters of less than 3 microns, millionths of a meter, more than 10 times smaller than a human hair. Allied Signal Corporation in the United States has attempted unsuccessfully for more than 25 years to produce a single fiber of a similar type material. Today, the Ukraine has the capacity to produce these raw fibers at the astronomical rate of 100 tons per month. These materials are currently being produced in applications involving brake shoes and clutch plates with extraordinary performance characteristics. These materials sustain only about 15% of the wear currently attributed to asbestos-based materials used in identical applications, with the added advantage that they are environmentally friendly, non-toxic and non-polluting. In current applications, parts fabricated of basalt fibers actually operate at higher efficiencies as surface temperatures are increased, up to operating temperatures exceeding 800 degrees centigrade. Basalt fiber materials have also been shown to demonstrate superior insulating capabilities over commercially available materials in applications involving both temperature and sound. They have been used in applications related to mine roofing, trays of water cooling systems and as both gas and fluid filters. A 4-inch deep pile of 5 micron filaments has been shown to demonstrate heat insulating. Properties in excess of R, 65 which is nearly four times the efficiency of glass fiber equivalents, at one half the weight. Further, basalt fibers have been woven together with threads of tungsten, chromium and other strategic metals to produce cloth materials with previously unheard of characteristics. Woven metallic threads and fabrics of this type have never before been produced anywhere in the world. This writer, Gary Vesperman, has included in his advanced self-powered electric vehicle concept, chttp colon slash slash 3c dot de slash doc slash gv short summaries 1 hyphen 4 6 a dot htm right parenthesis a monocoque unibody basalt slash carbon fiber foam body slash frame the ipms manufactured basalt slash carbon fiber foam is extremely strong yet lighter than fiberglass a test vehicle made with basalt slash carbon fiber foam parts was reportedly the only vehicle ever tested that can cut through a cast iron London taxi cab in a collision. To utilize this technology to create an automobile enclosure, three technologies are needed. 1. The basalt fiber technology can only be found at the IPMS. There may still exist some spools of the stuff in or around Kiev. The principal value of the material is that it has a softening temperature of 805 degrees centigrade. Two. The Russians use powdered metallurgy to alloy their strategic metals the ideal mix of metal powders would be aluminum and magnesium. Since both can be found in finely particulate powders and when mixed together in the right ratios, these two metals form a material which is utterly resistive to corrosion and which has excellent tensile strength. 3. The powdered metals are mixed in a chamber-like dry cake mix and then applied using a third technology in IPMS documents. This technology is referred to as a high-temperature gas plasma detonator. The metal powder is poured into a ceramic container, which funnels it into a specially designed high-temperature containment vessel which is also surrounded by super magnets, see IPMS Kiev and Arzimas, 16, super magnets elsewhere in this energy invention suppression compilation, arranged in a very precise order to create a compressive effect. When the powdered metal is brought into the chamber, High voltage, high pressure and extreme magnetic fields reduce the metal powder to a plasma, which is then expelled through a nozzle and onto a target in this case, the woven basalt fiber which creates the shape of the vehicle. When the metallic plasma collides with the basalt fiber material, it has a temperature of about 1600 degrees centigrade. This causes the basalt fibers to soften and partially melt but the cooling gradient for this material is so steep that it cools almost immediately below 800 degrees centigrade, at which point the fibers reconstitute. This creates a basalt fiber reinforced metal alloyed shell which is extremely strong, very lightweight and can be polished to a high sheen. This is the technology the Russians have used for 35 years to create fuel cells for their huge rocket boosters and it is the reason their boosters are so light, 
have no gaskets or seams and can be reused over and over again. It is primarily because of their extensive use of these integrated technologies that the Soviet space program has been able to consistently deliver larger payloads into orbit than any other nation. Since the space race began in 1957, joint ventures of the IPMS with more than a dozen private sector companies to develop useful inventions have been repeatedly sabotaged by the U.S. government's Defense Intelligence Agency and others. Source, David G. Youth, The Anthropos Files, Tales of Quantum Physics from Another World 2nd Edition, 2007. Remy Chevalier, Reporter, Nickel Metal Hydride Batteries, Solid State Lithium Ion Batteries. The best nickel metal hydride, NIMH, batteries are no longer on the market. Why? Because either. Cobasis has no intention of ever mass producing powerful nickel metal hydride automotive packs, or they just don't know how, even though they own the patent. The cells they displayed at the last EDDA conference were bulky at best, and certainly a million years away from the level of engineering exactitude Japanese automakers expect from their suppliers. Essentially, Matsu Sita took some of the information from their original, but mediocre patents and developed a functional NIMH battery that gave a range of 160 miles to the General Motors EV-1 and 110 miles to the Toyota RAV4 EV. This Panasonic M95 was also getting January 2000 deep cycles and 100, 000, 150,000 miles on a battery pack. Something the oil companies and Detroit automakers don't want on the market, despite the Fortune 500's good mood for natural capitalism. So now that the best nickel metal hydride battery technology for electric vehicles has been removed from commercial circulation, Toyota, Honda and Ford are stuck using inferior nickel metal hydride battery technology in their hybrids. Toyota has indicated it will take up to four years for the next generation lithium-ion Li battery chemistry to be as reliable and affordable. Till then, it's touch and go as Toyota can't crank out enough hybrids off the assembly line to meet demand, especially in deliveries to corporate fleets, taxi cabs and limousine services. State-of-the-art lithium-ion chemistry is in limbo at some California-based company who has managed to secure the exclusive production rights to the only Li-ion technology that really counts, roll-to-roll solid-state battery production. That's right, no more liquid chemistry no leakage, no overheating, no explosion, extreme lightweight, easy mass production. Just like printing mylar off a printing press. Just like laminating plastic photovoltaic sheets. Instead more conventional liquid Li-ion chemistry is being pushed feverishly. Toyota is buying out. Major Li-ion startups in Asia. Other Li-ion battery companies like Valence, Electrovia, Kakam, LG. Chem have attractive polymer Li-ion batteries, but they are still all based on the older liquid chemistry model, and therefore more expensive and more complicated to produce. The chemical genius who came up with the Li-ion solid-state polymer roll-to-roll -roll protocol is a professor at MIT who does not own his own technology. MIT owns the technology, and it is the MIT licensing office which gets to decide what companies do or do not get awarded these licensing rights. This revolutionary technology has been in limbo since 1995. Is it because MIT is cashing checks from the Rockefeller Brothers and the Ford Foundation? Is it pure incompetence? Is it a repeat of the cold fusion debacle Gene Malove wrote about in his book Fire From Ice? It's hard to tell as everyone involved is terrified to talk about it openly, which is why I am not mentioning any names. Frequent visitors to the Electrifying Times website know exactly who I am talking about. My suspicion is that certain forces within the military, and now Homeland Security, do not want solid-state roll-to-roll Li-ion batteries from entering the civilian marketplace, the same way you can't buy green, a special duct tape developed for Groton electric boat workers to strap metal parts, so strong it instantly bonds to the skin, 
requiring surgery if accidentally touched. What a poor boy to do who wants to save the planet if the powers that be won't give him the affordable batteries he needs to make a 0 to 60 in under 3 seconds ev with a 200 mile range on a single charge. That's the question we should all be asking ourselves instead of lamenting about who killed the electric car. The batteries are there, being manufactured for military applications all over Connecticut. If you want plug-in hybrids and 100% pure EV so you don't ever use a drop of gasoline again, with equal to if not better performance than any liquid fuel engines, then ask yourself why MIT, since 1994, has done very little to get their solid-state Li-ion roll-to-roll battery patents into production. Don't follow the money, follow the trail of misappropriated and shelved patents. Congress needs to put back into question the entire review process of patent law and its consequences on environmental health by imposing strict fines to whoever is caught buying patents for the sole purpose of keeping its protocol out of commercial circulation. Excerpted from Who Killed Better Batteries by Remy Chevalier, Electrifying Times, Spring Summer 2006, Volume 10, Number 1. www.electrifyingtimes.com Eric Masson adds more details in his suppression of Quantum Leap Inventors Electrifying Times, 2007. Volume 10, Number 2, Chevron Texaco bought into a Detroit company, Stanford Opshinsky's Energy Conversion Devices, ECD, and changed their name to Cobasis. ECD held the original patents on nickel metal hydride battery technology, but never successfully marketed a turnkey nickel metal hydride battery for major markets. They did sell a considerable amount of nickel metal hydride batteries to General Motors for the EV1. Panasonic came along and refined this nickel metal hydride battery technology into an indestructible battery of higher energy density and longer life. That enabled the Toyota RAV4 EV, electric vehicle, to get 80 to 120 miles out of a battery cycle, and get over 100,000 miles of battery life out of this improved nickel metal hydride battery. ECD Cobasis filed a lawsuit of patent infringement against Panasonic and won. This action essentially shut down the import and use of the Panasonic M95. Nickel metal hydride battery that was so successful in making EVs practical for the General Motors EV1, Ford Ranger Electric PU, and the Toyota RAV4 EV. As a result the proven very popular M9590, Ampere, our nickel metal hydride is not for SAE. In the United States. ECD Cobasis also put heavy licensing fees and restrictions on the NIMH battery used in the Toyota's present hybrid fleet.